Uh, I can see the number of attendees that are coming in right now. And right now we have, if you all would be patient as we expect, as we have the attendees coming into the room. I think one of the things I'll do during the, if um, you're on mute and I've asked you a question, I'll just put up my finger like this and you know you're on mute and you click off, okay? Okay, the number is populating. So we have people coming into the room right now. Okay. So hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. My name is Dominic and I shall be your host for today. I am the PR manager for SolveCare and I am based in Malaysia. Welcome to the Physician Roundtable on Will Telemedicine Be the New Normal Post-COVID-19? This is brought to you by SolveCare, the global healthcare platform that seeks to redefine our current healthcare system by leveraging blockchain technology. Now, I am super excited about today's roundtable session, but one thing is clear. The current state of our healthcare system is in, affects each and every one of us. And the fact that we have close to 1,000 registrations for this roundtable from all over the world shows that it is a global concern. So today, we have participants from the US, India, Canada, Philippines, South Africa, Bangladesh, UK, Singapore, Ukraine, Australia, Nigeria, Belgium, and the list goes on. Right. Uh, I thank you all for your presence today. And as you know, Telemedicine has recently seen a surge in adoption due to the current COVID-19 crisis we are all experiencing. The question is, is telemedicine just a trend, a stopgap measure to help cope with this crisis? Or is this the future of how healthcare will be delivered and accessed? So to discuss this, we are very, very fortunate today to have physicians who are experts in their own right to take part in this roundtable discussion. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed members of our roundtable members. First off, we have Dr. Ashraf Afan. Dr. Afan has been disrupting healthcare for the last 27 years. He currently serves as the president and founder of Angel Kids Pediatrics, as well as the president and founder of a comprehensive online resource that assists breastfeeding mothers nationwide. With extensive experience in healthcare transformation and clinical optimization, Dr. Afan is a leading expert in digital health implementation, change enablement, and healthcare operational excellence in Florida, where he has developed the largest pediatric practice in Northeast Florida. Dr. Afan completed his pediatric residency in Nassau University in Medical Center, New York, where he received the Beth Seaton Award for Resident of the Year in 2001 and served as Chief Resident the year later. Dr. Afan has also worked as a consultant for the World Health Organization and many international nonprofit agencies and projects aimed at improving health and well-being of children around the globe. Next member of our panel is Dr. Swapna Vadia. Dr. Vadia is the Director of Psychosomatic Fellowship Training at Mount Sinai St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. Dr. Vadia has more than 20 years experience in the field as a clinician and leader. She completed her medical training in Mumbai, India, and did her psychiatry residency at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. I'm not the director right now. I'm actually the director. Oh, sorry. So just wanted to correct that. That's not my title. I'm the physician executive at Multicare Health System right now. Sorry. Oh, okay, I, I do apologize. Uh, okay. Uh, but you also serve as a psychiatric consultant for Genev at a web-based consult a company specializing in women's health and menopause. That's correct. And you are dual board certified in general adult psychiatry and psychiatry of the medically ill. So Dr. Vadia's interests include mood and anxiety disorders, women's health, psychopharmacology, and psychotherapy in the medically ill, cognitive behavior therapy, and mindfulness-based oh, mindfulness stress reduction. 
The third member of this panel is Dr. Evan Lipkiss. Dr. Lipkiss is also known as the rational physician and has over 35 years experience in the medical field. He combines standard medicine with complementary medicine to write health books and cherry picks the best supplements for the benefit of his patients and readers. Dr. Lipkiss is also the author of Doctor in Your House, an award-winning medical e-newsletter that provides readers with practical nuggets of concise medical information that can be easily incorporated into their day-to-day -day life. Dr. Lipkiss trained at Northwestern University Medical School and currently practices at Glenbrook Hospital in Glenview, Illinois. He has served as the president of his local chapter of the American Cancer Society, hosted the Medical Insights on WTMX Radio, and lectured nationally with the former Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett. He has also served as a medical consultant for WGN Radio. And Dr. Lipkiss is also an editor for Prescriber's Letter, an international newsletter for physicians, and has been recognized as one of the top 50 doctors in the Midwest, according to checkbook.org, a consumer's report endorsed organization. He was also listed as a top doctor by leading physicians in the world 2018. Last but not least of the members of our panel is Dr. Ashish Chawla. Dr. Chawla is a urologist at Cleveland Clinic Canada. His scope of practice includes treating both benign and malignant urologic conditions with a special interest in minimally invasive surgery. In addition to treating patients, Dr. Chawla is also a staff urologist at St. Joseph's Health Centre an associate urologist at Toronto Rehabilitation Centre and a lecturer in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. Additionally, he is a diplomat of the American Board of Urology and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Since completing his training, he has been actively involved in medical education, received several recognitions including teaching awards at both postgraduate and undergraduate levels. Dr. Charla presently heads the Endourology and Minimally Invasive Surgery Fellowship at St. Joseph's Health Centre. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. David Hanakam. Dr. Hanakam is a Chief Medical Officer and Regional President, North America of Salt Care. Dr. Hanakam brings with him 30 years of experience in medical and chronic disease management, having worked with and led clinically integrated networks and multi-payer high-performing accountable care organizations across the United States. Prior to joining SolveCare, Dr. Hanacom served as the CEO of the Arizona Care Network, where he led the organization's efforts to develop better healthcare systems in the state. He also held the position as Chief Medical Officer to several industry-leading healthcare companies, such as SPH Analytics and Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, where he supervised a spectrum of medical management activities. A seasoned medical professional and experienced physician, Dr. Hennekob subject, subject expertise include medical management, managed care, payment transformation, and population health management. Now, before I hand over the floor to Dr. Hennekam, I would like to impart some housekeeping announcements to our guests. Uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A tab. So if you have any questions for our members of the round table, please state your name and the country where you are from. And there you can write out your questions. At the end of this session, we will collate the questions for our round table members and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So please remember, state your name and country where you're from before writing out the questions. Now, it gives me great pleasure indeed to hand over the floor to our moderator for today, Dr. David Hanakam. Dr. Hanakam. There you are. Thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, that are joining us, uh, the panelist members, thank you very much for making your time available. We certainly live within very unusual times. Uh, the world significantly changed late last year when we started hearing about a novel coronavirus infection that we 
um, affecting the people of China, which has subsequently become a pandemic. And so as we look at how the world is changing and how it has changed, it has certainly impacted every single one of us lives. Um, no matter where in the world you are, no matter what your circumstances are, what your background is, what your education is, what your preferences are, and what health system you have access to, the pandemic is impacting every aspect of our lives. And so one of the things we want to discuss today is a little bit about how healthcare delivery has changed, how you see the world uh, in the future in terms of impact on physicians and care team members as we strive to meet the needs of patients. And so uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. I'll start with a very simple question. We have about uh, 45 minutes to have a discussion and then we'll take questions from our audience across the world to see what their concerns are as well. But I'll start with uh, Dr. Um, Chola. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your life and particularly how you practice medicine? Well, as, as, you, uh, as you mentioned, it has completely changed everything. <laughs> it has, uh, you know, before virtual care was gaining a little bit of traction in, in, in Canada, but COVID has really accelerated that, that movement uh, to the point now where even as a surgeon, where the bulk of my practice is interacting with patients, um, the clinical aspect of, of meeting patients before now has gone all virtual whether that be either phone calls or telemedicine um, and really filtering patients to that point that do require some type of treatment surgically but uh, we've gone completely virtual and that's i assume everyone so it has just dramatically revolutionized uh, medical care I'll ask the same question of Dr. Lipkis. Dr. Lipkis, as a general internist in the Chicago area, uh, your, your traditional mode of interaction with patients are face-to-face -face visits with the need to interact uh, quite closely with patients. As a general internist, same question to you. How has COVID-19 changed how you practice medicine? the channels which you use, and what impact has it has on you and the rest of your staff? The stresses of this whole thing have been immense. I mean, both my wife and I practice internal medicine. And so the first stress is, number one, I, you know, I just uh, have celebrated my 42nd anniversary. And I will tell you this, that just being able to live together and to develop the gratitude and the deep appreciation for one another is something that maybe in a lot of marriages you take for granted, but uh, it, it's something that's extremely important. And that's one lesson that this has taught me. The other is uh, a lot of patients are very stressed. Uh, they're undergoing the same um, almost accelerated interactions between their children and their spouses. Uh, they're frustrated. They want to actually, a lot of them want to actually have a visit with me in the office. Uh, but I have found that just with telemedicine, you can really accomplish a lot because with internal medicine, I really have always thought that half of internal medicine is psychiatry. It's understanding people, it's interacting with people, understanding their needs, their wants, their desires. And so I have found that it has worked very, very well, the combination of texting, emailing, and, and telemedicine. But it has definitely been a big strain on the system, and it's definitely taught me gratitude and appreciation for what I have. No, thank you for that. I think what you're describing are the small joys of being human, the ability to touch someone, the ability to be close to somebody, to be in a group, to be able to communicate and experience um, events in life are really critical to our humanity. And what COVID-19 has done 
has put some distance between us for that, but there are other mechanisms to do that. So Dr. Alfan, as a pediatrician, uh, we know that as a pediatrician, you have at least um, two patients, the child and then the caregiver or the parent or the loved one. How has this impacted you um, caring for a large number of children? And I know that in your area, you have a very large Medicaid population as well as children with chronic diseases. So the impact on you, your family, your practice and your staff, please. You're on mute, Dr. Afan. Thank you. Here Sorry you for that. <laughs> thank thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, pediatric is a very unique uh, speciality. Um, you know, as Dr. Hanika mentioned, that we, uh, um, I manage a big group where we have around eight offices in the city of Jacksonville, which is a very large city, um, uh, mass-wide uh, place. So. Um, we, we got impacted actually negatively like all other people and we were taken by surprise. All of a sudden we woke up, I think, on the 16th of March where this day uh, we just saw that the load of our patients is not there. You know, they were worried about coming to the office. We actually went down by around 70% of, of the visits. I'm trying to get all those statistics because besides being a physician, I run the practice where we are a private group. So we have to look at our financials. And I know a lot of people would be really worried who are in this setting of a private uh, practice. What are we going to do? What, what's going to happen to our employees tomorrow? How can we balance between safety and uh, the financials and the needs for our patients? Um, making it a little bit more complicated also is um, life is, did not stop with, with the COVID. A lot of newborns were coming, you know, those patients needed some vaccines. And as everybody would agree with me, vaccination for children is really very important because right now we're talking about some re-emergence of measles, of other diseases because of not being able, and I'm talking globally, uh, not being able to bring those uh, patients to the offices. So uh, really it was a big hit, you know, as everybody would agree with me, but thanks for the telehealth, we could uh, at least normalize our uh, visits, be uh, in touch with them and continue the care. Uh, continuity of care was a big, big issue for us, for our patients who are on chronic disease. They need refill on their medications. Asthmatics need to have some attention as well. So this is how we manage. Uh, thank you for your perspective. And so Dr. Vadia, you are a uh, practicing psychiatrist. And so your area of special interest is the human psyche uh, Certainly in my career, this is the first time as a physician where a threat exists that has a similar threat to the individual physician as it has to his patient and to society in general. In other words, as clinicians, we were trained to be the external subject matter expert that provides advice, services and procedures to patients based on the best interest of the patient. But to some degree, we were isolated from the suffering and from the various things that can happen to a patient. Can you share with us, I, I hear a lot of fear and reluctance of not only clinicians, but their staff and their patients to interact with each other, but through a virtual mechanism. How is COVID-19 impacting the well-being of clinicians, their staff and their families, and what can we expect to see in terms of the reaction of caregivers and clinicians in terms of a prolonged COVID outbreak that requires social distancing? You know, thank you, Dr. Hanukum, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, I've listened to all the panelists and I appreciate their experiences and their, you know, struggles during this. Um, so for psychiatry, I would say that being a physician executive, where I'm at in my hospital system, we have experienced similar struggles. Now telemedicine is um, familiar from a psychiatric perspective and yet it was underutilized. So what I also experienced in this field was that there was a sudden explosion and utility of telemedicine in situations that normally we wouldn't practice psychiatry as such, such as in consul liaison psychiatry or in uh, uh, inpatient psychiatry. And the reason was that to mitigate risks to patients and staff. 
we found that uh, surprisingly, uh, even though our patients with severe complex issues actually were able to appreciate this modality and you know pretty much coped well. Um, yes, there are some exceptions and some of our patients may not be able to utilize this modality, but I would say that for a majority of patients, 80 to 90%, they responded quickly. Now talking about the other aspect you asked me about our physicians, especially the ones on the front line. Um, so I do volunteer for a service, it's called a physician support line. Um, this is a free service. Uh, I know people sometimes think a psychiatrist offering free service, but yes. This actually was started by another doctor, Dr. Mona uh, Masood, and I volunteer for that line. And our purpose is to provide uh, psychiatric support to our colleagues. Um, doing these sort of shifts, as I call, I have been um, you know, quite um, uh, familiar with uh, some of the struggles of our frontline health workers, the PPE issue, the issue of uh, feeling not well protected or to not know the consequences of COVID and the mortality and the morbidity associated with it. So as we are in this process, we are also now looking towards the aftermath of this COVID response of the lockdown. We're looking at social isolation, depression, loneliness, um, you know, increase in suicidal thoughts. And so psychiatry, I would say, is the integral part and I think a glue that is going to hold together uh, the response that is not just faced by our frontline health workers, but patients as such. So for personally, I, you know, I'm a great believer in innovation, technology, and any platform that would offer solutions to integrate care, as well as to reach out to our patients who are uh, understandably afraid to come to our offices or are seeking um, newer modality of care, which would give them accessible uh, options to their doctors of their choice is something that I would support. So this is how, you know, I would say that COVID has transformed my thinking, as well as the practice in general across psychiatric uh, hospitals and clinics. Uh, thank you for your insights. So let, me, let me transition now to the technical aspect of providing virtual access and virtual counseling and advice and consultations. Um, can you share with me some of the challenges and, uh, that you've experienced in the last few months um, in terms of supporting your practice and the needs of your patients, specifically with regard to any of the telemedicine solutions that you're using. What were some of the challenges? Uh, what did you have to do to, to get the services to your patients that you needed and where are their opportunities for improvement? And let me start with you once again, Dr. Chawala. As a general, as a, as a well, urologic surgeon, uh, your, your expertise apart from diagnosing and managing patients with complex urological problems is also the technical aspect of doing surgery, et cetera. Can you share with us as a surgeon how your telemedicine solution or solutions that you had access met your needs and what could have been done better to make you be more successful? And I'll ask the same question of each one of you in turn. Yeah, and I, I think because of the acuity of the situation, um, you, you know, very few of us were prepared to really uh, meet the needs of our patients in a virtual way. Um, certainly that was, that was our experience. Um, and, and so th there was a mad rush here uh, to sign up for various telemedicine solutions that were available. Um, you know, some of our hospitals were more prepared than others, um, but still very much underutilized prior to, to all of this. Um, you know, as it is a, there's a uh, human component, a large human component to everything that we all do. And that's something that's been um, missed uh, dramatically over the last couple of months. Um, and, and I think the, one of the key components of an effective uh, platform and, and is something that speaks to that human component. Um, and so the limitations of a phone call um, whereas when you can see someone visually and pick up on their cues and really connect with your, your patients and understand, you know, are, are they, you know, are, are they appreciating, are they holding back on something? Is there something more that I need to be probing or asking? 
Um, and so to me, I think those are the real distinct elements of a great solution. Um, you know, for, for us, we've really needed to um, discuss and, and try to get across some of the, the major issues and the intricacies of performing surgery with a patient, the informed consent, and, and to do that when they're not in front of you can be, can be a challenge. Yeah, very interesting. So Dr. Lipkus, uh, as an internist, um, not having um, impersonal contact with a majority of your patients, you shared with us that it, to a large degree, met your needs well in terms of the cognitive components of healthcare delivery. Um, share with us a little bit your experience with, um, for example, were you able to collect vital signs from patients? Uh, was there any integration with Bluetooth devices? Um, did you rely on patients if they had a home blood pressure med uh, medication or a blood pressure cuff to share those results with you? What were some of the technical challenges, if any, that you experienced as trying to get the information you need to be able to, to practice your art? Well, it was very hard to get that information because the first thing that I was struggling with was, was what kind of platform am I going to use? I actually went with uh, different platforms. I tried, uh, I looked at Amwell, I looked at various other ones. And honestly, I'm going to be really bluntly honest. There were, there were complexities to these platforms that I did not like. Uh, there was a middleman, um, big corporate middleman. That's all the way I can explain it taking a chunk out of the visit that you're, you know, look, this has been financially also a struggle. And when you have a big corporation that manages a, tele, uh, a telemedicine platform, taking a big uh, chunk of the money out of your, you know, your visit, that's really not great. And uh, so what I really did rely on was a combination, which is less than optimal, a combination of texting, just phone calls and emailing. And, um, you know, there's obviously many deficits to that kind of planning because you can't see your patient, understand what they're feeling, looking at the visual clues that you usually have. And uh, so there was, it was definitely frustrating and that's where I feel actually uh, where Solve comes in. And that is one of the reasons that I gravitated towards this platform, which I'm sure we're going to discuss later. No, thank you for that. So Dr. Alpha, and I'll come to you next. And what you hear Dr. Lipkin just talk about is some of the complexities and frustrations. We know that healthcare is very complex. It is an interrelational dependency on not only human factors, but science, technology, and various other policies, procedures, payment, uh, regulations, etc. cetera. Um, it is difficult enough, as I speak to my colleagues, to be an effective physician in today's environment, no matter where you are. Did you experience some of the same complexities? Uh, I am also interested to know whether you tried more than one platform, and what were your experiences with the the technological enablement that these solutions were able to bring and potentially what are areas for focus or improvement in those solutions? Okay, so the, the, biggest, the biggest problems with telemedicine today are one I've alluded to, the financial aspect of it. You're not getting paid what you deserve. The second um, big problem is that some of these platforms are very complex. I always, you know, the last three letters of my name are KIS, keep it simple. And that's one other thing. The third problem is uh, reimbursement and insurance companies where with Solve it's instant uh, with these platforms, uh, you know, it, it isn't. And uh, so those were the, you know, those were the, the, the major, major issues that I had had problems with. Plus, the other issue is that 
one of the things that attracted me actually to solve is you have a worldwide uh, amazing connection on the blockchain. And that is just an incredible, uh, an incredible thing because this is going to connect to people, to insurance companies, to benefit administrators. Uh, this actually is going to make a big, big change in how we conduct medicine and how doctors interact with patients, not only in their own locality, but worldwide. Um, so I'm, I'm just unbelievably excited at what such a platform, Global Health Exchange, actually yields to practicing doctors, because it's going to change our world completely. Oh, thank you for that. Dr. Afan, your experience with telemedicine over the last few months, um, some goods, some areas where you think there could be improvement, and what do you think we should do to make um, the new normal uh, work better for you? Okay, thank you. And uh, I think I would echo with what my colleagues just said, everything that they uh, mentioned about the struggle and the uh, problem they had, we experienced this as well. Uh, of course, all of us were taken by surprise for, you know, what happened. We were trying to rush into uh, any platform that's available for us. Even if we have been using it before, we did not know about some technical issues like this uh, connectivity, the Wi-Fi, how many people are trying to get into the telehealth. I would take Zoom, for example, or any other company. We had a lot of downtime, leave alone uh, the, the complications and, and the complex of those platforms for some of our parents, you know, who are using it, they were not very comfortable being able to download the system. So it's, it's really was a problem. And I'm going to elude also for our physicians. Uh, a lot of physicians were nervous. They would, you know, uh, something that they haven't done before. They always like to do a, a physical examination on patients that took some effort on our side as administration to, uh, give more training, talk to them more uh, about how to ease the, the utilization of, of the telehealth platforms. So in my opinion, there is a lot of opportunities in the future for innovation on how can we simplify, and I would just agree with uh, Dr. Lipkitz on how Solve uh, got to have a, a more user-friendly, easy way of simplifying, taking all those problems, listening to uh, what the issues are and then come up with a solution that's really readily available and make sure that both parents or patients and the providers or physicians are comfortable using it. Oh, if I can just that. make one other comment, and that is privacy. Uh, I don't know how many physicians out there have been hacked or have had ransomware. Uh, this is a, an, uh, this is really affecting everybody's practice. But if you can imagine having the security of medical records on the blockchain, where the blockchain has never been hacked in its 10 years of existence. And I think that that is uh, an extreme advantage of this platform. Whereas when you're talking to patients, you don't know who is being, I mean, Zoom has been hacked, let's face it. They've had trouble, troubles with hacking. Uh, HIPAA is a big issue, and we all as physicians want that to kind of go away. And uh, so that's, that's another attraction of this, this global tele-exchange platform uh, that it offers physicians, privacy and security of medical records. No, thank you for that. Let me, let me uh, transition a bit before I go to Dr. Hardy uh, around uh, privacy, confidentiality, and security. It's, it's certainly a major issue, um, being able to secure uh, personal health information and being able to meet the regulations and laws across the world is a top priority for Solve in terms of um, using our blockchain platform to enable the practice of medicine in its various forms across a global community. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Vaidya, you are very familiar with the use of virtual modalities to be able to consult with patients, 
do cognitive behavioral therapy in various other methodologies that you use. Mm -hmm. Have you had some concerns with the current tool set that you have? And what would a secure solution look like from your perspective? And then the last, another piece to this is um, uh, integral in the design of a, a blockchain solution such as ours is the control of the patient, not only of their information, but also with whom they share it with. In other mm -hmm. words, we believe very strongly that the individual wallet holder, the patient, has a right to have access to their information and that they should have choice and total authority to, to share that information in a secure way with another clinician or care member of their choice to get the services they want. So share with me some of your concerns, some of your experiences and how you think uh, blockchain could potentially be used to improve that relationship and the security of information across a system like this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Hanukum. And I'm going to echo a lot of what the panelists actually talked about in terms of the current existing apps. So just to share a story, um, I think I was a bit of a um, sort of like doomsday uh, sayer when COVID first started. And there was this whole concept that, you know, maybe we can, and psychiatry is not going to be affected. But the whole point is that psychiatry is also made of individuals with physical illnesses and mental illnesses. And we work and we were in a hospital setting. So very early on, I talked to our IT team and we actually found out some HIPAA compliant apps. We, it's not great. It's called a life size app. But at the same time, um, I think that we were able to sort of circumvent some of these issues related to HIPAA, uh, issues related to the breach of confidentiality with Zoom. Um, and able to give a platform to um, our clinicians because we had to rapidly pivot. But that being said, I think that these platforms, they definitely have drawbacks. Number one, um, no platform can be as secure as a blockchain technology as we just talked about. But the issue was that a lot of our patients, given that they are Medicare and Medicaid patients, did not have access to tablets or to smartphones or what have you. Um, I think the federal government rapidly pivoted and did give us access in terms of payment parity to see patients even via phone and other such uh, modalities. But that also then brings this limitations of um, how we would assess a patient on the phone without having the visual cues, which are so essential for a psychiatrist. So seeking and having a platform that would offer that and would offer that in a way that is HIPAA secure and protects the confidentiality is very, very important. Um, also, Dr. Lipkis, even I joined Anvil just to see what that platform was. And I 100% agree with you about the fact of the middleman, uh, the fact that there is this whole chunk and the payment that is not coming to us um, in a timely fashion. And why is that? So why these complexities exist is because we have taken away this relationship, which has to be pure and simple between the patient and the doctor, and then kind of utilize a platform that would offer doctors to practice in a way that has to be self-satisfying. So as a psychiatrist, I think we have a lot of room to you know, innovate and grow. And I don't think that the current existing platforms are suffice. That being said, I do wonder about the medical legal aspects sometimes about even a platform such as Solve or other platforms. Uh, the reason being, I think for a psychiatric uh, emergency, one has to ensure that the patient that you're seeing is in a place that the clinician can contact and connect and communicate if that patient is in crisis. So I'm also sort of curious to see from this platform how that would be addressed and how that can kind of provide some degree of um, you know, support and some degree of peace while uh, practicing on such a platform. So that's actually a question to you, Dr. Hanukum. Yes, no, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use the time uh, that we have in the panel. We're getting a large number of questions from our community. Many of them are very specific to the issues that you're talking about. But let me use what you've just said. The issue around privacy, security, auditability, and um, uh, security. Um, 
the concept of blockchain is, is that you can audit, it's transparent, it's very secure, and it's a distributed ledger, which means there isn't one central database housing the critical information that can be hacked. One of the greatest fears that individual patients have, and clearly physicians as well, is what happens with my medical information that's generated and that is shared across the ecosystem currently how do I know that information has not been used by someone for the wrong reason? And then also the information that is being generated are generating revenue and value to other stakeholders, but not necessary to the patient. And so the questions we get is what's going to be done with my information? How do I control where my information goes? How do I make sure that when my information is shared with my doctor, for example, that that information isn't also shared with pharma companies, uh, various other people that may not have a, a need to see that. And so those are some of the technical aspects that can be managed through the auditability, the patient consent process, and the uh, transparency of patient consent. Dr. Chawla, I'm going to um, transition to what I'm hearing the panelists say, which is, as a physician trying to do my job, which is care for people and provide advice, consultation services and quarterback services to them so that they can get their needs met. I want this to be simpler. I don't want to see administrative complexity. Um, I don't want a duplication of the environment I already live in. I want to get back to the physician patient relationship and I want those other administrative processes and payment to be more seamless and easier. Now you work within a national health system, so it's slightly different to those, for example, for us in the United States and other places where there's a fee-for-service system. But as you think through that piece, how would you design or deploy a blockchain-enabled uh, care coordination network with telemedicine as a feature to kind of remove some of those uh, barriers? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, our, our system is unique. It's, it's a um, national system, uh, as, as you mentioned. Um, the payment structure for physicians uh, within the province and the country varies. Majority are fee for service. There are some that are on salary, but they are, there's a single payer. And so, in some ways that does um, make things a little easier uh, when we are dealing with a public system because we have a single payer system. Um, on the other hand though, it, it, it provides other challenges that, that come with that. Um, and, it's, and it's a different environment. A seamless solution on my end would be a, a platform that would allow you to do everything. So you can see the consultation, you can interact with the patient, and then at the same time, you can, you can take care of the, the billing and the payment process, the administrative process, all in, all in one setting. And that is, um, as we all know, the beauty of a blockchain solution like, like Solve. So the fact that you can have a, you know, a physician can have their own blockchain address, uh, you know, effectively their own, their own digital currency a wallet that's unique to them and interacts directly with the patient. Um, I mean, it does, it, it does a, a bunch of things uh, that, that I think really it, it democratizes healthcare, not only for those rural areas in a large country like Canada, but also globally in other underserviced areas. Now you have the ability for patients to get access to a great Rolodex of physicians that they otherwise would not have access to. Um, you can get some of the best trained physicians out there that and you know credentialized and 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 know that you're getting great care um, whereas before you could never get that um, aside from getting on a plane and, and getting down there and then as dr lipkis mentioned it gives the physician a great opportunity to have access to a global a global audience of, of patients um, but that seamless solution of of the the blockchain it's it's uh, it's very unique and it's a very elegant solution to an all to a, to a large problem. No, thank you for that, um, panelists. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you 
a statement about our view of how a global telehealth exchange should work and, uh, and our intent in terms of deploying it and get your feedback. I'll start off with a very strong belief that I and Pradeep, the owner and um, founder have is that no matter where an individual citizen lives in the world, whether you live in a sophisticated first world country or in a small rural very somewhere in the world, uh, a patient should have access to a physician of their choice where they can interact, communicate with and get advice through a virtual media. Um, that this world is a flat world and physicians and healthcare providers are scarce resources that are unfortunately focused in other in areas of the world and their large areas of the world where those services are not available and a global telehealth exchange that is patient centric would make available to every patient, no matter where they are in the world, a group of clinicians that have specific skills, capabilities, and willingness to help them with their advice. Your thoughts about a global telehealth exchange where the patient has access to physicians and clinicians from over the world, where we can connect and based on the physician's willingness to provide services, based on their credentials, based on their willingness to see patients outside their geographic area, and of course, coupled with smart contracting that will manage the legal and regulatory capabilities so that the patient can identify a worldwide community of physicians who are willing, able, and authorized to provide services. That future, do you think it has any legs? And anybody can answer. This is a game changer because you're going to be reaching out to, as you said, rural areas, small areas, areas in the world that barely have an internet connection. Look at, look at what we as physicians do. If we cannot solve a problem, one of the first things we do, at least as an internist, is we send people to specialists, okay? And then when they can't solve the problem, we send people to clinics, a Mayo Clinic. Uh, it doesn't have to be the Mayo, but people come to the Mayo Clinic from all over the world. Imagine having these people right at your doorstep that you, can have access to some of the brightest physicians in the world if you need it, okay, is a game changer for people. Uh, because unfortunately in some areas, it's, it's very hard to see a physician. It's sometimes uh, with one payer systems, it might be very difficult. There might be a long wait. Um, in fee-for-service, there, there might be, um, how, how should I say, it might be financially burdensome for the patient. So we as physicians, as a network of physicians, have the ability to, one, control the prices, two, to make sure that uh, the world connectivity is at the patient's feet. A Mayo Clinic can be just a second away. I think that's what this system really, really does that no other system can even match. I appreciate that. So Dr. Lipkins talks about patient centricity and the right of the patient to have access to advice and to individuals that could potentially help them in their journey. Can you share with me um, um, as a round table, your thoughts around the complexity of payment across the current infrastructure in your various countries. Now, all of us, in this round table happened to practice in, in, in North America where the complexity of payment is a whole chapter by itself. But there are very large parts of the world where patients pay cash or individually negotiate prices with physicians where physicians do not have the complexity of the payment mechanism in the United States where they can set their own prices, where they also dispense medication, et cetera. It is our belief that physicians should not be dealing with the administrative complexity 
of technology and policy procedure as much as possible, that their focus should be on that cognitive engagement and the relationship building and on providing good advice, a very specialized advice to individuals and their families. In a global telehealth exchange uh, payment through a token system that is freely available with the individual clinician setting their own pricing and smart contracting automating that process will improve the administrative complexity of today's current systems, which will free physicians up. What are your thoughts about the solved token as the mechanism of payment across an ecosystem where the solved token can be purchased on the free market, individuals can set their prices for whatever services they choose to deliver um, uh, and can then publish that and then patients prior to accessing those services can exchange tokens for the physician. And this will allow for instant payment, guaranteed payment, it's auditable, it is verifiable and it's a global payment system. So let me take some of the barriers away of getting services outside your immediate area. And then lastly, um, since this world is flat, um, it would result in bringing more patients who need additional healthcare services than they can get in their immediate area. And I see this working not only from um, less developed countries to more developed, but vice versa as well. Uh, there are a very large number of expatriate physicians like myself who trained in other countries, have journeyed in our professional journey across multiple countries and may be situated in a different country where they hold multiple licenses, not only in their local environment, but also in their countries of origin. Do you believe there would be an interest of those clinicians to provide services back to their country of origin where they licensed, um, compatible with regulations? And do you believe that individuals from those countries that there is a demand for their services, whether I'm a expatriate physician from India or South Africa working in the US or whether I'm an American physician and I have patients that work for a multinational company who are living in India or in South Africa or traveling for the next few months in the world. So broad question, but your thoughts around um, acceptability of this, this type of ecosystem where I can choose my physician, I can select which patients I'll see, and I can provide longitudinal care on a long-term basis for those patients using this type of technology. I'll start with you, Dr. Verdier. Yes, you know, I think that's kind of the utopia of medicine, isn't it? I mean, I uh, honestly remember my childhood. My dad uh, was a family practitioner back in India. Uh, he's retired now, but I think this is exactly what he did, right? I mean, he had his panel of patients. He chose how he would help people. He determined prices based on, uh, you know, the capability of the patients able to pay him. And he was able to do altruistic medicine for patients who were not able to, you know, pay him. But he controlled that relationship, you know, the authenticity of the relationship without all this platform. So the reason I'm saying that is that right now I'm in America. I trained in India and now I'm here in America. And I do see that the um, whole complexities of healthcare here, especially with managed care, fee for service and the barriers that are there. And I think that telemedicine, even though it was embraced pretty widely in COVID, we still have those barriers. I mean, there are still issues with the pay for parity. There are still issues with how we can contain, continue to sustain this. Uh, and then we talked about the barriers. Uh, then we talked about these platforms themselves. So I do feel that if there was a way that, as you mentioned, with the legalities uh, being outlined in different countries and uh, having some sort of arrangements made, um, to explore if a physician would want to have such a practice on a global basis. Um, and in addition, um, I think you and I talked about it briefly before, but there is an opportunity to create something for population health, such as collaborative care registries for chronic diseases. I'm a big believer of you know, mind and body sort of integrated care. 
And I think that this platform can offer an internist or a surgeon or anyone else to have access to a collaborative care psychiatrist who can help them treat their patients without having to diversify it and without having these patients to kind of like go to different, you know, institutions. So there is so much that on this platform one can, you know, practice psychiatry the way you want to, practice medicine the way you want to, but most importantly, outreach to patients who need that care. Um, and we have places here, even in, you know, America, rural areas where psychiatrists are very scarce. And I would imagine that such a platform would um, actually provide that access and provide that ability for the patients to access care, as you said, even at the topmost institutions, such as Mayo, wherever, uh, given if that's what the need is. So uh, personally, I would say that, yes, uh, I mean, I am more interested to learn about the logistics of how this would look like when you practice on a platform. But the more I have read about Solve and the more I have talked to you, Dr. Hanukum, I do think that um, this would be the future of where medicine as such you know, goes. Talking about the Solve currency, um, I would say that it sounds to me as a very easy way where there is a token uh, sort of like determined by the physician that the patient can then either agree that this is the price set and can either see or refuse to see the patient, so uh, the doctor. So I think that there is a lot of... Um, uh, ability for the patient themselves to have some uh, control over their care, which I think in these current platforms that we have, whether it's AMRIL or whether it's our managed care, um, I think the barriers are too many. So that's my opinion. No, thank you for that. Uh, go ahead. But, uh, fun. I've heard from, from physicians Certainly in my area, I, I, I have a chronic condition and have been interacting with my care team, the various physicians that, that try and uh, advise me to act in my own best interest. <laughs> um, and um, they have gone through multiple telemedicine providers in the last few months um, and um, defaulted to um, getting on a FaceTime meeting with me because I'm an Apple device um, owner and then typing into the EMR as the best, best approximation of the visual contact versus the documentation needs. Have you heard similar stories? And uh, are you um, hearing of physicians that are, that are signed up with five, six or seven different telemedicine solutions to try and meet the needs of patients? And does this make sense long-term in terms of a practical solution in a world where probably we're going to be seeing more virtual medicine combined with on-site medicine, whether you're a primary care physician or a surgical or proceduralist um, specialist in, in healthcare. Um, yes, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Hanikam. And what you just stated is co completely correct. I experienced this myself, uh, my colleagues in our practice. We went through like two, three um, different platforms, and unfortunately, each one would have its own limitations from streaming to complexity on how to use it. Really wasn't, you know, everybody's looking for this uh, one stop shop, one good solution. The, the other thing that I wanted to elude into um, the future of healthcare, especially in the United States here, uh, our practice is actually um, based on some big value based contracts for people who are familiar with this, for the value based contracts, especially in the United States. I'm going to give a little bit of a background that we have around. $3.5 trillion of healthcare expenditure. This, you know, maybe half of what the entire world would be spending annually just in the United States. Unfortunately, we're reaching around $1 trillion of waste and big chunk of that waste or one third of the healthcare budget is being wasted because of lack of interoperability. This is a word that for decades I've uh, experienced. Dr. Hanikam is one of the, the national experts on trying to get into this inter. Uh, of probability, the government is trying to put some rules into it, but yet it has been so difficult. We are over testing for around 250 billion annually, and we are wasting uh, almost 150 billion for um, not being able to uh, communicate. So if I have a, a centric system, you know, that would help me to have the continuity of care, which is really very important in our case, when the pandemic happened, we were not 
uh, we did not uh, stop the care for our patients, if our patients will be going to the emergency room because this is the only way that they can have uh, you know, their healthcare uh, needs met over there, it would have been a disastrous in our case with the risk sharing contracts for, uh, for, for our uh, payers. So by all means, having this good system uh, that is very simple and um, address the administration and address the payment way is really going to be a win-win for you know the saving that everyone and every country is looking for in, in, in the healthcare. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to transition to, um, we're at the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of your time and those of the individuals that have joined us on this webinar. We have some very a large number of questions, and if I can start with answering a few. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, uh, how can doctors providing teleconsultations be safeguarded from the medical legal aspect if things go wrong some way? And so this really talks about a global exchange and what are the legal protections for patients as well as clinicians in terms of the medical legal environment? Um, I will share some of my thoughts with it. And then if you have any comments, please add to that. Certainly in terms of our thinking of, in terms of a global telehealth exchange, uh, the patient should have choice as to where they um, choose to uh, connect with a clinician of their choice who can meet their clinical needs anywhere in the world. It is the responsibility of solved through the design of our um, technology and through the verification and smart contract mechanism to make sure that we connect a clinician with a potential patient compatible with local and international law, which means we need to have a clear understanding and will of where the patient is situated and what the medical legal environment is there, but more importantly, where the clinician that they're considering um, is available and what those restrictions and regulations are. And through that mechanism, together with the consent of the patient in terms of what type of patients you'll see, what kind of conditions or field you're going to practice in, and in which countries you're willing to provide your services, with that knowledge and with smart contracting, we can make sure that we do not um, put a patient in front of a clinician where it is illegal or violation of international, local, or state law. So that part is automated to the solution. That's the first thing. The second component is there is risk to any patient interacting with the health delivery system in, in terms of potential un, un, um, uh, events, et cetera. That is a reality of life. Telemedicine, um, when used appropriately, does place an additional burden on the patient. So if I'm a patient, for example, in Botswana, who chooses to see a clinician in, in um, the United Kingdom, then I must understand that I'm going to take some risk that if the advice given to me has adverse effects, that the only action I can take against that clinician is to do so in that clinician's country. And so it's our commitment as a company, as a technology, as a platform, to make sure that patients understand these risks and that they accept these risks as part of getting services from a remote clinician. And so it is a very complex area. Um, there are areas where there are very distinct law and regulations as to the requirements. And there are areas in the world where there aren't uh, well-established regulations. But what we'll do from our perspective is to make sure that as much as possible, we protect both the uh, patient and the physician. We will be um, advising and requesting that most physicians carry malpractice insurance. Most physicians, certainly in um, the United States, do carry malpractice insurance. I am very aware of the cost associated with that. Many of the insurance carriers all over the world now that provide these kind of services actually do provide riders or supplements for telemedicine. And so part of our credentialing process to allow a clinician onto our network is to make sure that those requirements are met. We're also in the process of negotiating with the insurance carriers internationally to see if we can generate or they will make available products on the global telehealth exchange that will allow clinicians, no matter where they are based in the world, should they choose to provide services 
either to their own countrymen or their own area or to other countries, the ability to purchase such indemnification so that we can protect um, both the, uh, both the um, stakeholders in terms of patients and clinicians. So it is a complex area. You'll be seeing more of that. It'll be a very transparent uh, process and um, that will be useful. Um, questions to you, have you had any difficulty in um, or have you been asked in your current positions to um, purchase telemedicine and specific insurance products by your employers on your private practice? Go ahead, anybody uh, on the Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually our carrier for malpractice insurance just mm -hmm. added the telehealth for us with no extra cost, you know. And mm -hmm. I think this is very important to mention here that, you know, in my humbled opinion that telehealth is never gonna be a replacement, a full replacement for uh, the conventional way that we do physical examination on patients and, mm -hmm. you know, surgeries, for example. So uh, uh, it's very important that, you know, uh, uh, as as a company, as you know, a practice, as physicians ourselves, that what we did in our practice, we set some criteria, triaging criteria for what patients will be suitable or what conditions will be suitable for telehealth. And, and we have an algorithm, we'll go through it. And at a point we can stop and redirect this patient either to be um, uh, uh, sent to an emergency room or come back to the office to, um, you know, kind of finish that management for health, his health condition or our health condition. So it's really very important that we don't give this to middlemen, as Dr. Lipka said, or other people who are doing it just for the financial versus us, we will be able to set the criteria for what, how to optimize the use of telehealth. Telehealth is always gonna be a complementary and a supplementary for the conventional medicine that we need to do. I think that's a very important point you're making, uh, Dr. Afan. Um, what we're seeing the transition occurring is a hybrid model of providing both in-person services, uh, whether it be facilities, procedures, evaluations, et cetera, and virtual. And the art is going to be, how do you integrate those two in the best interest of the stakeholders? And so this new hybrid model, whether you are a primary care physician, a proceduralist, a sub-subspecialist, or an administrator means that a solution or a network must allow for those various role players to interact in a safe and effective manner. So to our specialist colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Chabla, as a surgeon, there is a significant shortage of those skill sets across the world, and it is unevenly distributed so at your practice in the Cleveland Clinic, are you, for example, thinking of, of relationships with other service providers in other geographic areas where telemedicine can be provided to an individual and then cooperating with a local lab, radiology, or, clinic, or clinical or facility to get the services and vice versa so that the world becomes a flatter place and we can get the services to individual patients uh, as much as possible without the need for too much travel. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point. I, I, I think the way that we need to approach it or the, the way that we've been looking at approaching it personally is that if you, you take that, you use telemedicine as a, as a funnel to really, you know, screen and, and address the needs of many of your patients. And the majority of that can be can be perhaps addressed in a non-surgical matter, at least in, in my field. There are gonna be some patients that are gonna require a little more focused attention in terms of their, either their diagnostics um, and, and certain just some things that just can't be done over, over telemedicine. And, but you, you hope that with the right guidance that you can help direct your patients to someone either in their jurisdiction or their area, that, you, that with your guidance, you can kind of give them that opportunity to do that. Um, and so, you know, obviously, if you have a vast um, network of qualified physicians globally that, that exist and that are on a telehealth network, then one, one um, opportunity there is that, you know, if you have someone in a different jurisdiction, you can direct them to a physician over there that, that, can, that can help. Um, and, and so I think that will be 
a, a big component, as you mentioned, of this new hybrid system that we're going to practice. No, very much. Thank you very much for that. I want to transition in the last few minutes to a really critical component. Although this discussion and the roundtable are clinicians and specifically physicians having uh, input into their needs. And the reason we do that is we know that physicians have a critical role to play in terms of leading and making sure that patients um, receive the care and access that they require. But all of us know that the critical um, success of any clinician is the care team and the other critical stakeholders that are part of that team, be they registered nurses, practitioners, behavioral health coaches, physical therapists, occupational pharmacists, the list goes on and on and on. The intent of the Global Telehealth Exchange, although we've been talking about the role of the physician specifically, because of their leadership role and their, their need to be part of this for this to work, are the rest of our team members. And so, um, a focus on effectively allowing for care coordination across a global telehealth exchange is a critical component. Uh, I see a global telehealth exchange with the appropriate stakeholders being made available to individual patients all across the globe, expanding the expertise and services that they can get. For example, a patient in a, in a community where certain services are not available and or affordable could suddenly through a global telehealth exchange get access to those services. Whether that, for example, is diabetes educating, whether that is a, a pharmacist that ma manages complex medication regimen, whether it is a, a, a urologist supporting a general practitioner and managing a patient with significant urological, whether it's a general internist with complementary medicine skills who is speaking with somebody, uh, whether it is an infectious disease specialist from India that deals with malaria and these infectious diseases every single day, or whether it's an African um, provider who has a specific interest in schistosomiasis, et cetera. So when you think about putting the entire ecosystem in the best interest of the patient and allowing choice, I think we get a much larger team that can provide the necessary support that either the individual patient or the practitioner. So it becomes a more global community. And so we will have future discussions about those issues, but I want to make sure that um, everybody understands that the global uh, telehealth exchange, a role player is the physician. And the physician is as important as any other role player. And I think uh, physician sovereignty, the things that you talk about, about can I get back to a place where I feel more released to engage my patient and their family and the community, as opposed to meaning, dealing with technical and administrative complexities will enrich my life and improve the patient experience. And then the last piece is, um, there is going to be a need for all of us, no matter what the role is, to learn how to communicate with people virtually. I think it's a very specific skill set. I hear from many physicians across the world and other care, um, coordinators and other stakeholders. How do you build a relationship with somebody virtually? And how do you create, build trust? How do you share information securely? And how do you make sure that you can longitudinally provide care to individuals as opposed to episodic? So those are the challenges all of us will face. Um, I wanna thank all of you for participating. I want to share with you my admiration for all of you. You are the true heroes, you're in the front line. You make decisions for and with patients and their families every day. And I, I thank you for your bravery uh, this is a very different world. This is not the same world for a clinician and a worker in an office or anywhere in the world as it was six months ago. And so I hope that you will experience some benefit from um, our plans and that I, in the future uh, you could come back. And then lastly, to everybody on the webinar, um, thank you. We have many questions from you. We unfortunately don't have time to deal with many more, but we will be providing you 
with frequently answered questions that will provide more information about the technical details and the various other how, what, when, etc. But let me assure you the commitment from SolveCare and the team that I represent, we do want to be part of making the world work, uh, healthcare work better for all. We are passionate about the need to put the patient back in the center of healthcare delivery. We understand the need for complex regulations, laws, and processes to administer a really complex uh, ecosystem. But at the same time, we are absolutely determined to make healthcare work better for all, to reduce the administrative burden, to improve the security and the confidentiality of the relationships, and to make sure that we can support in a meaningful way, those that use our solution. So I thank everybody for joining today. Um, and Dominic, I'll hand over to you if you have any final comments to our panelists and or any of our participants. Well, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hanneke. Uh, now, just to close it, uh, you summed it up very well. I would like to thank and extend my sincere gratitude to the members of our round table, Dr. Afan, Dr. Vaidya, Dr. Lipkis, Dr. Chawla, and yourself as well, Dr. Hanakam, for providing us such an interesting and insightful event. So to our members of the audience, right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for your presence. Do take care, be safe, and goodbye.